You know, sometimes the, the most profound uh, statements are very simple. Like an ancient Chinese proverb which said, to know and not to act is not to know. <laughs> See what I mean? We know a lot about this California power crisis. What we know is these artificial legal entities that are chartered by your state government, PG&E, and, uh, or by some state government, if they happen to be Delaware or other corporations, Edison, and your local utility here, which has uh, set records for lack of popularity, I understand, around the country. Um, they have now created the following situation. They essentially drafted the bill that the legislature passed for deregulation of electricity prices in 1996. They sent it to Sacramento, they greased the wheels, just like Medea Benjamin pointed out, and they got it through unanimously. Almost nobody knew what was going on, and when something passes unanimously, it's either mother and apple pie or something cooking that doesn't <laughs> smell right. It passes unanimously. Two years later, we qualified an initiative here in California. You know what that takes. Lots of names and put on the ballot a measure to roll back some of the harder edges of uh, deregulation, because we could see the, the thunderclouds on the horizon. PG&E and Edison and others raised 45 million of your dollars, sent some grants to some so-called environmental consumer and other groups, put together a phony coalition of these front groups, and splattered the television with $45 million worth of ads. We had no money for ads. They won three to one. People in California voted for Pacific Gas and Electric and Edison, San Diego Power and Light, and so on. Well, that was 1998. Now we can say, we told you so. Next time, when we put an initiative on the ballot, you better find out who's behind it and not look at the TV ads. A good rule of thumb for California voters is not to look at any political ads, no matter where they come from. <laughs> read, read your thick ballot, ballot book and you'll find out who's, who's sponsoring and who's arguing for these ads, if not who's paying uh, for them. You'll get a sense that, that if the initiative process wasn't around here in California, and thank goodness to uh, Governor Hiram Johnson, early part of the 20th century, he took enough time out from his governor's duties to push for the amendment in California Constitution, gave you the initiative referendum recall. If you didn't have the initiative power here in California, it'd be over. Governor Davis and his friends in the legislature would transfer all those billions of dollars right on, onto your utility bills, which would be going through the roof. The only thing that's giving them pause is the prospect that Harvey Rosenfield and others will qualify an initiative in, the, in 2002 to bring back regulation and to bring back refunds and to punish those politicians who turned their back on the defenseless ratepayers. That's the only thing. Now you see how important a tool of democracy is? It's important. Because it says that whatever you do in Sacramento, boys and girls, that's not the last word. The last word is going to be the people who are writing their own law and putting it on the ballot. That's the key. We should never forget that. The other thing that's important is to look at what these executives said when that bill was being proposed, just to show you that they got exactly what they wanted, but the greed of the power generators and the greed of the parent companies, PG&E and Edison, squeezing billions out of their electricity company subsidiaries, the parent bleeding the child, that all this and the lack of any competition in the wholesale electric generating market just turned this whole thing into a monster. But it's their monster. And they're not going to be bailed out this time. This time, the solutions are crystal clear. 
You re-regulate electricity, which is a critical, absolutely critical commodity, can never be allowed to fluctuate like a speculative widget. It cannot be played around with by out-of-state and in-state corporations, gyrating the prices 5, 10, 20-fold. This, this, this is not a, this is not a dot-com stock, you know. And so you go back to cost-based regulation. That means the regulator looks at the cost to the company of producing and dis dis distributing electricity, adds on a nice little profit, uh, whatever, 8, 9, 10, 11 percent, and that's it. It's a secure business, as it was for years. Uh, it, it, it was a monopoly for years. It was stable for years. And the idea of opening it up to competition never worked. They opened it up to monopolies, to manipulators, to speculators, to greed beyond the dreams of corporate avarice. That's what they opened it up for. Even Dianne Feinstein now is complaining about these corporations. I heard her at a hearing the other day. She says, you know, wholesale prices for electricity have gone up 10, 12-fold. There's no explanation for that in, in terms of their costs. The costs hasn't gone, haven't gone up that way. But they see an opportunity on the spot market and so on, and up it goes. And the, the solutions are really clear. Where is it in California that the consumers are not being gouged, that they're being shown how to be more conservatory, that they're getting more prospects of renewable energy? The municipally owned electric companies like Sacramento, which is the first electric company to shut down a large nuclear plant. And they did it after a referendum of the people urging them to do that. And, and uh, the Department of Water and Power in L.A., run by David Freeman. So any money that the state of California spends on electricity should be used for a buyout. And it should buy out the transmission systems, the hydroelectric dams, uh, and buy them out at the fire sale prices that they are now are available uh, to be bought out. The stocks are at a, at a low. This is gra grave mismanagement. Uh, by executives who are vastly overpaid. Imagine, John Bryson is head of, of California Edison. He's now being paid with all his, you know, bonuses and everything, three million a year. Now, you'd think a company is about to go bankrupt, a company, a company whose executive falsely stated, this is this one, this is John Bryson. Here's what he said. Here's what he said uh, a little over five years ago. He told the LA Times, quote, the best, soundest way to move to a desirable competitive market that will benefit all customers, large and small, Southern California Edison is committed to a 25% rate reduction effective January 1, 2000. As near as we're able to tell, this is consistent with our goal. When deregulation was passed, Bryson hailed it as a great day for us, quote, a great day for us, he called deregulation, quote, a large achievement and a sound achievement for the state in terms of giving customers choice. No, so he was wrong, right? And uh, you know what happens in the military when uh, submarine captains are wrong? Well, what happens in the electric utility industry is they ought to be fired. That's what they ought to be, fired. And John Bryson ought to go back to his old environmental group because he obviously mismanaged and misprognosticated this whole situation. And now, he's saying in Washington a few days ago that the problem starts because the wholesale electric generating market is not competitive. And that's, that means that these companies like Enron and Dynergy and Reliant are manipulating and they're engaged in queuing each other. It's very easy, queuing each other. You don't have to meet in a back room with cigar smoke. You can queue each other in when there are just a few large generators, especially in an era of computers, cue each other in to manipulate the market price. That's where we are. Now, this is a great opportunity for California. You've got corporations caught with their hand in the cookie jar. They, they, asked, what they, they asked for what they got. It blew up on them. 
They're now gouging. They want a bailout. They want anything to save them. They don't want to cut their massive salaries. They don't want to refund all the billions of dollars that the parent companies took from the electricity subsidiaries to invest all over the United States and foreign countries and to buy back their stock, to pump up their stocks. They spent billions of dollars there. And to give a huge dividend to Southern California Edison uh, a few months ago in order to make it look even worse in terms of California Edison can't pay its bills quick, Sacramento, bail us out. All of this is an absolute great opportunity to do the following. Re-regulation, refund, renewable solar energy and energy efficiency set in the stage and an example for the rest of the country, and public power. There's no reason that electricity should ever be subjected to corporate price manipulation. There are 2,200 cities and towns in our country that own their own electricity company. And that's what you should do here in California, along with Sacramento and Los Angeles. You know, there's a right-wing free market economist who's on your public utility commission. His name is Richard Bilas. Is that the way to pronounce it? Bilas. And, uh, Early this year, he confessed. Here's what he said. Quote, as a free market economist, it is difficult to recant and utter these sentiments. I do so because I do not see true competition in the market and because our market surveillance economic experts assert market manipulation must exist to cause these unprecedented prices. I'm deeply troubled by the lack of power. This commission has to go after the culprits in this scenario with, through their collusion, are bringing the utilities to the brink of insolvency and the reliability electric system to the edge at great cost to consumers. To paraphrase Adam Smith, never do men of the same trade get together when they do not do harm to the public. It must be stopped. Those generators making windfall profits at present have no incentive to curb their behavior. After long reflection, I must conclude that the surest way out of this dilemma is for the legislature to immediately establish a California power authority to set the rules of the game and to have the power of condemnation, that's eminent domain that Medea mentioned, at fair market value over all state generation. Calls for behavior modification have not worked. Action must be taken. End quote. This is a right-wing free market economist who is on, who is a commissioner of your public utility commission. Now, the only people that are going to make this happen are people like you. So, now comes the moment of truth. No more clapping. No more go get him, Jim Hightower and Medea Benjamin. It comes back to you. You got the power. You got to organize it. Years ago, when I was a little boy, my father said, Why throughout history have the few dominated the many? And the answer was, Because the few are organized and the many are not. Now, you have, you have the internet, you have gathering halls, you got students raring to go at uh, undergraduate and law schools around the state, you've got the initiative power. You now have to have a credible prospect as soon as possible that there's going to be an initiative. You've got uh, Senator John Burton, who runs the Senate in Sacramento. He's about the best you're ever going to get. He's the brother of Phil Burton, great congressman in Washington, D.C., the father of OSHA and, and forest preservation. Good lineage there. So at least you've got one body led by someone who wants a California Power Authority who would like to see uh, eminent domain and who would like to see public power. But he has, he has to look behind them and see that the people are behind him. Gray Davis, he's easy to figure out. There's only one thing in life he wants. It's called re-election. So if you show him that he's not going to get re-elected, he'll be your best friend. He'll be your best friend. 
He's got a lot of money in the bank in terms of his own campaign war chest. But that doesn't mean anything when the people get aroused and they begin saying, you're not defending us, Governor Davis, and you better put your foot down. Comes back to the people, doesn't it? How many people here are willing in the next year to band together with others to take over the electric generating uh, business and have it turned into public power so you don't just spend your money on a bailout, you spend your money on a buyout. That's what Governor Davis said a few weeks ago. He said he wants a buyout, not a bailout. So just let me test, let me test the, the level of indignation and action in this nice little room. How many people are willing to spend in the next year 50 volunteer hours in over one year? Let's see. Okay. All right, how many are willing to spend only 25 volunteer hours? All right, a few, okay. You got other things to do, right? Okay. You know what that is, that's 30 minutes a week. That's a terrible drain on your schedule, right? Especially since if you win this battle, do you know what happens? It's more than just a tempering effect on a skyrocketing utility bill. It's the message to the whole country that the tide is going to turn against corrupt politicians in the pockets of giant businesses. And the tide is going to turn so that the sovereignty of the people will prevail over the sovereignty of corporations as our framers of the Constitution envisioned it. That's the kind of signal. And it will spill over into what's the next battle? Universal health insurance for everyone in California. This is a booming state. You got. You got, you got the Children's Advocacy Center at the University of San Diego, Bob Felmus Group, and they are very good in terms of their facts, and they take the category of child poverty, the category of near poverty for children, two categories, poverty, real poverty, child poverty. You know how many, what percent of children in California live in poverty or near poverty? 45%. This is the booming golden state that apparently astronauts see from above the planet glowing with gold and riches. It'll spill over into many other things. This can be the stand that's heard around the globe because you got them right by the neck. These utilities have no arguments. They can't propagandize anything. The only thing that's saving them up to date is the, all these huge electricity price surges that have come from the power generators haven't all been passed on to you yet. There's a little barrier. When that dam breaks, there are going to be people hit the streets. They're going to demonstrate. These giant corporations every day engage in strategic planning. They're planning our genetic future, our financial future, our invasion of privacy future, our workplace future, our election future, our government future. They have a lust for control that's inherent in the large corporate dynamic, a lust for control, maximum control. They must have control. And they're, they're controlling both parties. Is there anything that they're not after? They want to control our natural resources that we own ourselves on the public lands. They're in control of $5 trillion of worker pension funds that belong to the workers. They're in control of the public airwaves that belong to us as a commonwealth, legally, not metaphorically, over which the radio and TV broadcast their insipid, stupid programs. <laughs> Using using our property for over 90% entertainment and advertising, and the rest either staccato-like weather, news, sports, and then a few nice programs that you see once in a while on 60 Minutes or what have you, or some Peter Jennings segments. But most of it is exploited. It's wasted. We don't have a voice on the property that we own. And they don't pay us any rent. They get this free. The biggest TV station in L.A. doesn't pay 
a license fee to the Federal Communications Commission. And they haven't since the early days of radio. Never paid anything. They got it from us free. If we make them pay rent, we could use that money to establish our own radio and TV stations and our own audience network so we can begin to communicate and mobilize ourselves. <laughs> See, what it comes down to is civic self-respect and civic self-confidence by you. That's what it comes down to. Don't think there's any other shortcut. It's all going to be rhetoric. It's all going to be exhortation. It's all going to be speechifying. Every time our country advanced justice, it was because the abolitionists worked to abolish slavery. The women worked to get the right to vote. The workers worked to get the trade unions and lift up their standard of living and safety in the mines and foundries and factories. And the farmers took on the banks and the railroads that were squeezing their livelihood. And then into the 20th century with the civil rights movement and other drives. People took it upon themselves. They didn't sit around saying, well, que sera, sera. You can't fight City Hall. What are you going to do? They're going to do whatever they're going to do. What they did is they generated civic self-respect and civic confidence. Now, how many times have people said to you, how's your social life? Huh? Hey, how's your social life? Well, it's not much to it, you know, I'm very busy. How's your social life? Anybody ever ask you how your civic life is? Because if we don't have a healthy civic life, we're not going to have a healthy society, and we're not going to have the ability to pursue happiness. We're lunching off the past courageous citizens of the past 200 years, and that lunch is dwindling down to a few crumbs. And we should be ashamed of ourselves that with all the, util, all the tools that we have, that our forebears never had, those farmers, those workers, those women, and those abolitionists, they had no electricity, no motor vehicles, no telephone, no fax, no email, nothing. And they did it. And what's our excuse? We got it all, including the internet, which was developed by the Pentagon. <laughs> what's our excuse? You've got to put it together. It's all in the papers, the abuses, the injustices. It's all in the papers and the magazines and the television 60-minute 2020 uh, programs of the mass media. They can now disclose all of these corruptions and these crimes and the politicians and toxics and pollution and all that, and nothing happens, which is why they say, hey, this is great. Do you know what an expose in the mass media is? that's followed by nothing happening, it's called entertainment. That's what it is. Mike Wallace had a segment about a year ago on poultry peonage, the farmers and the, the poultry farmers who are given the little chicks by the giant poultry processes, Purdue and, and Tyson. They're given the little chicks to grow, and they grow them, and it's tough, dirty work and the average little farmer grows 240,000 chickens and then sells them back. He make, makes a nickel a chicken, $12,500 a year. Gross. That was a terrific piece on 60 Minutes. Guess what? Nothing happened. You know, in the 60s and 70s, you get stories like that, there'd be a congressional hearing by Senator Magnuson or Congressman Rosenthal, there might be prosecutions. The regulatory agencies would open up uh, new standards for health and safety. Nothing happens. That is the canary bird, day after day, that tells us that the giant corporations are on a collision course with American democracy, and American democracy is losing. Our democracy is losing. Understand that. The Supreme Court yesterday ruled that under an employment contract, Workers are forced to sign away their rights to a trial by jury to go to court in a dispute with the employer, and that is enforceable under the federal courts, something that King George couldn't get away with. These corporations are getting away with. Our, our elections are being corrupted beyond redemption. Now the Republicans and Democrats have something called equal opportunity corruption. 
the companies pumped the money into the Republican and into the Democratic coffers. You saw that at the Republican convention in Philly and at the Democratic convention in LA. The lobbyists pu pulled up their stakes in Philly after all the various whining and dining and lubrications and so on. They went on a few days vacation and then they took the flight to LA to do the same thing. And so the Green Party's challenge commences last year. The Green Party is a party with the best, deepest, broadest platform. It's a platform that towers over the sniveling, wavering, avaricious, cowardly platforms in the Democratic and Republican platforms. You can't, you can't believe how bad it is. Here's when Tom, when Tom Hayden proposed certain pl uh, planks for the Democratic Platform Committee in Cleveland before the convention, they turned it all down. I mean, he was proposing just, for example, a, a statement to uh, have a national mission against poverty, to have a living wage. Well, they couldn't have any part of that. I mean, they're the Dem reps now, half Democrat, half Republican. Hybrids, the hermaphrodites of American politics. <laughs> Joe Lieberman, Chris Dodd, John Bro. You know, where are they? Who are they? Do they know who they are? Al Gore, three makeovers and three debates. Do they know who they are? Fork tongues. These are people who eat their own gums while they're talking politically. The Green Party is up against a tough challenge. The two parties control the ballot access hurdles. In some states, you've got to get tens of thousands of signatures, and then they pick at them, so you've got to get 20 two times what they require in California, uh, in uh, North Carolina, 100,000 signatures. They pick out, oh, this is the wrong color from the county. Disqualified. Out. They control the money. They control, the, they command the media attention. The media loves winner take all elections, you know. There's only two major parties. They control the debate commission, which is a private corporation created 12 years ago by the Republicans and Democrats, and they fund it with Philip Morris, Anheuser-Busch, Ford, and AT&T money. You remember the Anheuser-Busch debate in, New, in uh, St. Louis last year, don't you? It's supported by beer money. It's, 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 it's such a caricature. The greatest, the greatest democracy in the world, and, and it has to have its debates funded by beer money? <laughs> Anheuser-Busch-Gore debate, we called it, in St. Louis. And, and then, uh, and here's what the debate commission does. It's the only way any candidates, third party, can, or otherwise, major party, can reach tens of millions of voters. The audience has fluctuated from 37 to 92 million vote, uh, people watching those debates from 1992 to the present. And this is the Kyber Pass to the public. And so what do the two parties do with this little debate commission, which is a private corporation of their creation? They set the rules as to who can get on the debate and set the hurdle high so treble Olympic hurdlers couldn't go over that, those hurdles. 15% in the polls, you have to show, and five polls, all owned by the major media. So if they don't cover you, their polling subsidiaries don't jiggle it up, right? 15%. They decide who gets on the debate, they set the rules for the debate right down to the size of the podium and auditorium and everything. They pick the questioner, Jim Lair, and then they sit around and, and realize that there's all kinds of questions that aren't going to be asked them because it would be terribly impolite to ask Bush and Gore about corporate crime. Are you soft on corporate crime, Governor Bush? <laughs> would it be terribly impolite? It's terribly impolite to ask Governor Bush uh, How does he feel being the corporate welfare king of all presidential candidates throughout U.S. history? He did it by getting the city of Arlington to buy, uh, buy him a stadium for the Texas Rangers, turned his investment of $600,000, which I understand was borrowed, into a $14 million profit. Yeah, so he, you know, when he wants to end welfare as he knows it, would he? Huh? 
And then you say, and, and Mr. Gore, Vice President Gore, what about you? You wrote this book, Earth and the Balance, how important it was to do something about the environment, and you haven't made a major statement or even a minor speech on solar energy, on getting our country moving to convert fossil and radioactive nuclear uh, generating uh, fuels into solar energy. Not one speech, not one statement in eight years. What is he afraid of? What is he afraid of? He gave the, new, the motor vehicle industry eight years of holiday with Bill Clinton. No fuel efficiency standards. The Republicans couldn't have done worse than that. They couldn't have done worse than his holiday to the genetic engineering industry. That's zero. You can't do worse than zero. They did nothing. They gave him a complete free ride. No labeling of your food. No regulation. No scientific answers before they uh, lunge their technology on millions of acres of genetically engineered crops. Nothing like that. And yet, we just sit around and say, the pain of doing something is greater than the pain of doing nothing. And that's a dead wrong philosophy of civic abdication. Because there's nothing more gratifying than engaging our democracy with robust, informed, deliberative citizens. People are lonely. People are bored. People are tired from the commutes and all of that. Well, there's a way out. And that's to spend more time taking the solutions that are on the shelf in our country and putting them to work. Our country has more problems than it deserves and more solutions than it applies. And people say, I don't have time. Do you realize what it takes me to go back and forth from work in crowded traffic? And I say, yes, and I also realize who brought you this crowded traffic. It was General Motors and an oil company, a tire company, decades ago, who bought up 28 electrified trolley systems in 28 metropolitan areas, including Los Angeles, tore up the tracks, and then pushed for an a over-reliance on highways, aborting the enormously exciting public te uh, transit technologies that are now available. Not buses, much more exciting, much more personal, much more efficient. And we're paying the price every day in crowded traffic, chugga, chugga, chug, bumper to bumper. And we turn on the TV and we see the new car ads. Have you ever seen a new car ad in congested traffic? <laughs> huh? Have you ever seen an ad showing people going to work in a sleek mass transit vehicle, relaxing, snoozing, chatting with one another, reading the newspaper, passing a parallel highway with trucks, vans, and cars going bumper to bumper, slower than the old horses in 1900? <laughs> hey, we don't see that. See, it's, the scenario of the future is painted by the Madison Avenue hucksters. It's not painted by us. We're not planning our future. The corporations are planning our future. Imagine the ambition of these corporations. They intend to own our genes. The cotton plantations and others were beaten back. It took a civil war to say to them, you're not going to own human beings as slaves. And 140 years later, their descendants, their corporate descendants, are determined to own our genes by 20-year patents. And they already have patents on several thousand human gene sequences. And their goal is to transform the genetic inheritance of the Earth, flora, fauna, human, into intellectual property monopolies called patents. And we're sitting around saying, what the hell are you doing bothering me? I was just watching the second rerun of Cheers. Do you have any idea of how much fun well-grounded moral indignation is? <laughs> you know how much fun when you're so rooted in coming forward with irresistible rhetoric grounded in unassailable evidence? 
It's fun. It's enjoyable. It's fun because justice is fun because without pursuing justice, you don't pursue happiness in a society. Justice is a prerequisite, and our founding framers understood that. The pursuit of justice. The preamble to the U.S. Constitution starts out, we the people. It doesn't say we the corporations. It's we the people. And early on, early on, our forebears realized that this thing called the modern corporation was a potential Frankenstein. They had it under tight reins. The legislature would charter each company. They'd put them on a leash, 10 years in renewal. You can only do this. You've got to pursue the public purpose. They're completely out of control today. They have all the rights as corporations. They have all the rights we have under the U.S. Constitution, except the Fifth Amendment. They can't plead self-incrimination, defense against self-incrimination. They have all the rights we have as real human beings and all the privileges and immunities that they have as artificial entities doing things and being places that we can't be. Can you be in a thousand places at once around the world? Can you create your own parent, the holding company? Can you create at will all kinds of subsidiaries for evasive maneuvers? And as Jim said, go to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission the way PG&E did and at the end of last year and say, well, our parent company should be insulated from the debts of our subsidiaries. There are all kinds of privileges and immunities, limited liabilities, escape hatches, transfers of responsibility onto your backs in the age-old evolution of corporate socialism where these big companies privatize their profits and socialize their losses. Comes down to civic motivation. You can do me a great favor if before you go to sleep tonight, you stand before your bed and you say, civic motivation, ten times. <laughs> That's where it starts. And if you're not motivated for yourself, you should be motivated in honor of our forebears who worked their heads off to give us what justice we have in this country and who seem from the distant past to be calling out to us, finish the job. And if that's not enough motivation, then how are you going to face your own children and grandchildren when you deliver this tormented world and country full of promise and so short of it in terms of its performance to them? How are you going to explain global warming, ozone depletion, the cutting of the equatorial forests, the depletion of the oceans, the erosion of the land, the corruption and hijacking of our government by big business. How are you going to explain to them that 100 years after the reformers thought poverty would be abolished in America in 30 years from 1900, we now have enormous poverty compared to other Western democracies? How are you going to explain to them that they may not be able to afford health care, they may lose their life savings? How are you going to explain to them that the quality of education in this country, regardless of the venue, is lousy because they don't ex expose children and youngsters to civic training and civic skills and how to, how to practice democracy. So they come out of their formal education with their head held high instead of going through life on their knees as long as corporations stuff enough $100 bills in their back pocket for their work. How are you going to explain to, the, to, the, to your descendants. Yeah, we had all this medical knowledge, but we weren't willing to put it to work to deal with tuberculosis and AIDS and, and, and malaria and all kinds of global infectious diseases that are heading this way in drug-resistant strains, such as tuberculosis, which are killing millions of people and children. How are we going to explain that we allowed our government, because of Lockheed Martin and Boeing and Raytheon, to spend hundreds of billions of dollars in the coming decade on useless weapon systems against no known major enemy while we starved the research budgets for health care and for safety and for abolishing child poverty and providing efficient health care coverage with an emphasis on prevention. Are there better ways to use our discretionary time than engaging our democratic society and making our democracy proud. 
of its ability to solve problems or foresee risks and perils in the future? It's hard to think of any. And if you say you don't have time, you're not going to have even any time if we don't pay attention with some time to our civic responsibilities. Look at other countries where there are dictatorships. Those people don't have time either. They can't have time for democracy. We need to recognize that the way we parcel our time must be carefully considered. We must recognize that we have to have a little time week after week for our civic engagements. So we've become systemic in terms of applying systems of justice to our problems. Society that has more justice is a society that needs less charity. We have to ask ourselves, is our time being trivialized? Are we spending too much time chattering, not enough time on the great issues of our generation? We have to ask ourselves why we're suppressing our own talents, our own inclinations, our own sense of injustices, because we think we're powerless. And they tell us we're apathetic. Apathy is the other side of the coin of powerlessness. And I think if you go home tonight and you say, boy, that Medea Benjamin was really great. Hightower was great. Nader was really motivating. You failed. You want to go home tonight and say, I'm going to pick it up. I've postponed too long. And if I've been already engaged in civic activity, since this is a pre-selected audience, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expand it. I'm going to talk it up with my neighbors, friends, co-workers, acquaintances. I'm not going to anymore go through this California syndrome known as, I don't want to be judgmental. <laughs> civic movements come because people talk to people. They persuade another. They inspire each other. Friends and neighbors and co-workers and relatives. That's how it has been. That's how it will be. It'll never be anything other than that. No matter how much electronic media we have, nothing can compare with person-to-person -person interactions and discussions and persuasions. If you have been active, you can multiply your activity in many directions. If you've been active in a civic organization, you got to have a political party on your side, marching arm in arm. And that's the Green Party. You'll never see the Democrats and Republicans on a picket line for a living wage, or to preserve the Everglades, or to go after the taxpayer subsidies of stadiums and arenas while schools and clinics crumble in the same city for lack of repair. San Diego, Los Angeles, all these stadiums built with tax money while the schools and clinics crumble. And all kinds of public works are not repaired and expanded. Reminds us of the Roman Colosseum days, with one exception. In ancient Rome, they at least let the fans in free. <laughs> you go home. And you'll say, I'm not going to look at the evening news anymore the same way. This is our property. They give us a lousy 30 minutes late evening television news, nine minutes of ads, and they start out always with street crime because they believe in the axiom, if it bleeds, it leads. And then they give us one or two minutes on something's going on in City Hall. Then they do the prescribed report from the New England Journal of Medicine. Then they do the prescribed animal human interest story. And then comes the real important stuff, four minutes of sports and four minutes of weather, followed by a movie review. Have you ever wondered how this is a misuse of your property when you've got all kinds of citizen groups in San Diego who are trying to improve the city? They can never get 30 minutes on the evening news, 30 seconds, 10 seconds. They don't even get a sound bite. They don't bleed, it doesn't lead. They're not sports, they're not weather. 
They don't put a hole, uh, you know, uh, a, a ball in a hole. They don't get on TV. Basketball, March, March Madness. And it's the weather, the obsession with the weather. It's like, how do they fill time? How do they make sure these citizen groups with their reports and action don't get on the evening news? Well, you fill it with weather, you know? Out east, the weather starts with, there's a front over the Cascades, coming over Montana, over the Midwest, heading for the Alleghenies. You're saying to yourself, give me the weather. What is this? They have more meteorologists. Where do these guys come from? They have like 20 per TV station. Every day, there's a different one, different clothes, different suits. And then to fill out more time, they put all the little suburbs around the city. You know, they're two, three miles apart. And they say, 43 degrees here, 39 degrees there, 40 degrees there. And if that's not enough, they'll say 20 years ago, it was 44 degrees here, 45 degrees there. And now, <laughs> now they got a new wrinkle in Washington, D.C. in the late evening news. They call the, the weather section the storm center. I mean, these guys are sad if the sun's out. And they got a new wrinkle. Now they say, for breakfast, 44 degrees. Lunch, 45 degrees. Supper, it's going to go down. What do you do? It's beyond satire. How do you satire satire? <laughs> when I was campaigning last year, the only way I could get on national TV is basically to join the Feast of Fools. You know, the medieval Feast of Fools? The only way I could get on was to get on Jay Leno, to get on David Letterman, to get on Bill Maher, you know, politically incorrect. You imagine what it's like in the green room before the show? I'm saying, this is serious business. You can't get on. They put you on the Today Show, they got th three minutes, 40 seconds, and 10 nanoseconds. And you better get your answers down into five-second sound bites. I suppose we should be gratified. I hear they're predicting in the next decade sound barks. <laughs> That's where they say, Mr. Nader, what is your opinion on the latest Federal Reserve action to raise interest rates? Nope. <laughs> so you, you end up... You end up talking in conclusions. You can't give any kind of the, the greatest telecommunication system in the history of the world, and we're reduced to sound bites. Quick, 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 you know, quick, quick. So we can, you know, have these comic operas and, and these, these shows. And quick, make room for Jerry Springer, Sally Jesse Raphael, the sadomasochists of the 21st century. The only place where democracy comes before work is in the dictionary. We've got to work at it. So let me just end on, on this note. All over the country, there are people who have dropped out of politics, people who are cynical, people who are skeptical. You know the difference, don't you? The cynic and the skeptic. The cynic quits. The skeptic has the same acerbic view of politics, but roars back. That's the difference between the skeptic and the cynic. And, and it's just a matter of us getting together, analyzing the situation, showing how much improvement can be made here and into the future, here and abroad, and really having a muscular, civic-based democracy. That's what we've got to do. And for people, people are looking for meaning, especially here in California. They're always looking for meaning. I want to be fulfilled, they say. What better way is it than to be civically fulfilled? Your shrink bill will shrink away. Your consensus groups will be engaging in robust discussion of important issues. It's fulfilling. Students once came up to me in Ohio and said, you know, we've been fighting against this polluter for three straight weekends down the road and still polluting. I said, only three straight weekends? Really? Why don't you try four? 
It's as if there's no patience for civic. Civic effort is the warp and woof of our public lives. It's the way we engage our public citizen responsibilities so that our private lives are fulfilling and satisfying as well. So come together and make this a record setting night and then when we go to another city we can hold up San Diego as the standard not just in contributions but in time commitment. That's the key. The commitment of time means your specific talents, your specific character traits, stamina, resiliency, refusal to be discouraged. All these things <coughs> spell a successful uh, civic resurgence. And if you need any more evidence about what the problems are in our country, log into our website, votenator.org, and see all the position papers that outline these situations. Sometimes it's, it's hard to keep up. As Jim Hightower said, it's one thing to be cynical, but it's hard to keep it up. You know, hard to keep up to date. There's so much going on. Just the, two days ago, President George W. Bush uh, did a, uh, a repeat of Marie Antoinette. And Marie Antoinette, you know, when she was asked, uh, the people are starving. They have no bread, queen. And she looked at the courtier and said to him, well, why don't they eat cake? You know, they have bread. Why don't they eat cake? George W. Bush is telling us, let them drink arsenic. He, he's, he's repealed the arsenic, which Clinton could have issued a long time ago and issued right at the end and therefore made it look like it was a pre-midnight uh, hasty judgment. Why did all these good little regulations that Clinton issued after the election get issued after the election instead of before? You see the cowardliness? It might impair some of the contributions from the business interests. And so the ergonomics rule, which was ready, according to the doctors in OSHA, in 1995 was not issued until just before Clinton left office, making it vulnerable to an accusation that it was just a hasty, last-minute decision before it was overturned. And how did they overturn it? With the Congressional Review Act of 1996 that Clinton signed with every Democrat in the Senate voting for it and that act allowed the overturn of health and safety regulations without a public hearing in the Congress and without any amendments. 60 days, fast track. See how they work together? See how they work together? So we've got to build a new party. You can build it. It can be built. There's a tremendous reserve of alienation against the two party systems that can be tapped into. And I hope that this evening, with all the good people here who made it possible and yourselves coming here will take it to the next stage. Thank you very much.